Good morning, I'm Lina Delgado, Executive Director of the Colombian American Association. I would like to welcome everyone for what promises to be a great discussion between Maria Luisa Puy, Latin America Director at Eurasia Group and former Ambassador of Colombia to the United States uh, and the President of Pro Bogota, Juan Carlos Pinzon, on how Colombia is facing, facing the COVID-19 pandemic, its handling of the economic recovery, as well as the social and political challenges facing the nation. I would like also to introduce and welcome the moderator for today's program, Alejandro Rincón. Alejandro is, is an international journalist who serves as the New York correspondent of TNT24, and he also works for one of the most important networks in Colombia, RCN. Alejandro covers uh, stories with global impact, such as the 2016 and 2020 US presidential elections, the COVID-19 pandemic, and their work for the UN General Secretary. Thank you, Maria Luisa, Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Juan Carlos Pinzon, and Alejandro for accepting our invitation to this program. Alejandro, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lina. Uh, good morning to all. It's truly a pleasure to be with you this uh, Wednesday morning. I'm honored by the opportunity given to me by the Colombian American Association on moderating this panel. Uh, first, allow me to introduce you to Maria Luisa Push, director in the Latin America practice at the Eurasia Group, where she leads political risk advisement for uh, a group of countries, including Chile, Colombia, and Peru. Throughout her career, Maria Luisa has also worked and Lisa, welcome. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Also, Thank you. today is Ambassador Juan Carlos Pinzon. He's the president of Bogota, a space for the discussion and promotion of strategic projects for the capital region of Colombia. Mr. Pinzon is also the former Colombian ambassador to the United States and Minister of Defense. Ambassador Pinzon, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Welcome. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you so much. Now, a uh, quick note on the rules of procedure for today. Uh, we will begin our dialogue with a brief introductory uh, remarks by both of our panelists. We will have around three to four minutes for that. And um, uh, then we will begin uh, uh, the rest of uh, our discussion. Also, a very important note uh, in the rules of procedure, we will have our Q&A section always open for all of you joining us today. We will be receiving all of these questions and then in the last Last 15 minutes of our conversation, we'll be able, uh, hopefully, uh, to take as much questions as uh, we can. So now, without further ado, um, Ambassador Pinzon, I would like to give you the floor first. So if you could please uh, allow us to describe and to hear from you a general overview of today's economic and social environment in Colombia. What's the reality of the nation as to today, uh, September the 16th? Alejandro, thank you so much. And thank you to the Colombian American uh, Association. It's a great pleasure to be here again. It's not my first time, you know, during my time as my tenure as ambassador, I spent, you know, several times with this wonderful organization. And, and I want to recognize their effort to, you know, you know, bring Colombia to New York and to the United States, but at the same time trying to attract, you know, investors and a lot of interest from the United States uh, to Colombia. Uh, also, my regards to Maria Luisa. You know, I think Eurasia Group is one of the most uh, structured and serious organizations analyzing uh, the region and somehow the world politics and, and economics. So it's great to be here with you as well. And well, let me comment a little bit on Colombia to, as you said, give a little bit of framework. I will comment on, on COVID, you know, what has happened uh, related to COVID, then the economy, you know, where are we and what are the prospects and what can be done? And finally, I would like to comment a little bit on the political environment, which always matters, especially in a country like Colombia, where, you know, things happen, as they said. Uh, so, you know, when I think about the, the COVID, let me just tell you that Colombia, as of now, unfortunately has already more than 23,000 people that has uh, disease out of the, out of the COVID which is a very big number, very sad. Every family is, you know, somehow hit by this. Uh, as of now, more than 700, 730,000 people has been uh, found as uh, positive 
on PCR uh, trials. On the you know, relative side, I think Colombia has done better, if you can say this, uh, in this very dramatic global pandemic than many other Latin American countries and even many other advanced countries. Uh, the number I will use is uh, the number of deaths per million people. Number of deaths per million people, Colombia basically has as of now 467 deaths per million people, which is below Sweden, the United States, Spain, Italy, some other European countries, and definitely better than Mexico, Brazil, Peru, Chile, uh, Ecuador, among many others. Uh, but of course, when you have 23,000 23, deaths, uh, there's no way you can say this is a great thing. You, know? it's, 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 you have to be realistic. But, you know, looking to Colombian government, they have done two things that I believe are very relevant. The first, uh, they doubled the number of uh, ICUs in the country in a period of, uh, I would say, four months. And of course, that has provided Colombia with better uh, numbers in terms of saving lives than other countries. And second, there has been as many, as in many other countries, an economic effort that has implied uh, around $7 billion, which uh, is something like uh, uh, three to four points of GDP uh, in emergency funds. Initially to support 2.6 million families that uh, somehow uh, were the poorest of the poor. I would describe them as that. And of course that those families are right now receiving a, a, a support package uh, that's called uh, Ingreso Solidario. I think that has been relevant and probably will need to continue to move forward. And on the other side, uh, some funds, around 3.2 billion funds, and in addition to that, uh, central bank, uh, I would say uh, some expansionary monetary policy that has allowed first to keep uh, the liquidity in the market, but at the same time to provide some lines of credit to SMEs specifically, and it has allowed to at least, uh, you know, take this situation uh, in a very reasonable way. Now, when you see the numbers, and let me jump into the economy, my second subject, let's be fair, you know, we have right now uh, the last number for the second quarter of uh, 2020 uh, was a, a contraction of GDP uh, for minus 15.7%. That's the worst number ever. I think it's happening everywhere in the world. It's not Colombia, but this is the number Colombia has. And what has been problematic, especially in the city of Bogota, our capital city, where the lockdown has been useful in terms of saving lives, but at the same time, probably it overstand. And the consequence is that uh, the city has been uh, affected uh, more than the country as a whole. So the number of contraction for the city of Bogota is expected to be even worse than the number I described for, for the country. What worries me the most is unemployment. Unemployment has basically doubled as of July. Uh, we reached a number of 20.1% uh, for the country, which implies 4.6 million people without a job, unemployed. And when you think in unemployment for women, uh, that number is six point above. So uh, unemployment for women is 26%. And when you think about uh, the young people, uh, is the worst unemployment rate in the country is 29%. And of course, when you combine that with some of the frustration, social unrest, the consequences that a pandemia brings in terms of uh, even psychological misbehavior, if I can you know, underline this, uh, and in some cases even uh, uh, intrafamily violence among other diseases that you know, come out of the lockdowns is very worrisome and is something to be concerned and is a real challenge for Colombia. Now, let me give you a little bit of insight on how do I think the economy can be move forward and what is being discussed. I want to tell you that I've been personally even part of a group of private sector 
leaders, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, the leaders of the main economic groups in the country, and a lot of economists, as I am, discussing on what can we propose to the government and how can we coordinate with national government for a recovery policy and at the same time using this pandemia as an opportunity. And I think here's the positive. I think that Colombia historically has been able to find sound fiscal and macro prudent policies, which is positive. But second, historically, even on our wars of our times, by the end of 20th century, uh, when we had violence to the peak and all these difficulties, we were able to coordinate between private sector and government. What do I see that comes? One, we're speaking on structural reforms, a pension reform, which might be required, a reform on, you know, or, you know, resources to provide more uh, uh, spending in the in education to offer occupation to the youngsters and to find, uh, you know, digital opportunities for them. Thirdly, I believe it's important to discuss on a future tax reform. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen in the 2020, but probably in 2021. So it matters a lot to many Colombians not to lose uh, the, the, the rating, uh, the, the credit rating. And I think that's important not to get a downgrade and, you know, to continue to find a long-term policy. But at the same time, we understand that government is facing um, important fiscal deficit this year and next year. And that will imply for us that what matters is where that money is invested and how do we match funds between government, local governments, private sector institutional investors, and even people like the one is listening to us, international investors that we want them to come to Colombia. We have identified some like 300 projects from infrastructure to housing and even social infrastructure. Half of those projects are not requiring uh, public funds. Maybe some subsidies in the housing side, maybe some investment in the infrastructure side, mm -hmm. but also a lot of opportunities for uh, urban renovation and other housing projects that can be done with private, private money. I think that if we can structure those projects, if we can give them some kind of a streamline processes in terms of uh, uh, local permits or uh, even environmental uh, uh, standards, I think if we can move on to that, the economy can create, you know, more than I would say uh, two to three million jobs in the next 24 to 36 months. Finally, on that regard, the idea of creating a fund for uh, venture capital in digital economy, in somehow understanding that pandemia also brought to us a new thinking, a new technology, and the fourth industrial re uh, revolution, not anymore in a book, but now in our lives, as, a, as an example, this conference we're having, I think is a very big opportunity. And I think there's a lot of concern and, and perspective about, about that. Of course, the country requires more connectivity, the country will require strong efforts in the agribusiness industry, and all this is being discussed. I will end my remarks with politics and security, very briefly. Yes, the politics are getting more nasty in Colombia. Unfortunately, this is not Colombia, this is world democracy. When you see what is going on in Peru, when you see the United States elections being the most polarized ever, when you see what is going on in Spain, when you see what is going on in France, well, in Colombia, as a Western democracy, we're somehow having the same kind of debate and challenges. Of course, there are new things that are happening. Even today, there's a discussion on uh, the potential uh, freedom for President Uribe after being uh, captured uh, by request of the uh, Supreme Court. Those things are new for Colombia, are not new for many other countries. But in Colombia, it was a new thing, and of course, uh, we need to see how we move forward onto the second. The Havana agreements still are seen as a divisive force in this country. Uh, for some, is the opportunity for peace. For others, have been the consequence for the increase of drug trafficking, criminal mining, and of course, the uh, reborn and rebirth of new terrorist activity 
and crime in certain regions of, of the country. And finally, social unrest, as we saw in Chile, we saw in many other uh, regions uh, and, and parts of Latin America and definitely in the world, is happening in Colombia as well. I think that unrest can have a base on, on, on unemployment numbers and frustration numbers for the youngsters that I described. It implies policies dedicated to, to that sector. But on the other side, not to forget that in Colombia, still there are uh, terrorist structures that uh, have cells that can influence those uh, social cases and somehow create some violence that unfortunately we saw last week. Hopefully these are things that, as I said, are happening all around the region, definitely in the Western democracies. And we will have to foresee how to keep moving forward, seeking political agreements, political consensus, and somehow moving to, to, to the next phase. Finally, 2022 elections are going on. And the, what is strange these times is that usually they start a year before. And now I feel they are starting two years before. And when you're in election year, as is happening just right now in the United States, well, things become less rational and more passionate. And I think somehow uh, what is the bad news this time is that this is, this is uh, happening ahead of time. With this, I tried to just, you know, paint an overview. Sorry for, for, for being long, but I thought it was necessary to just put at least the elements uh, for discussion. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, Ambassador Pinson. Now, uh, Maria Luisa, from your expertise, uh, uh, which do you consider are uh, the topics or uh, that could uh, uh, our attention in terms of the current political environment in Colombia? What do you see from all of this crisis that's booming right now in the nation? Uh, what's your outline of the crisis there? Great, thanks very much. So I I would like to to start, you know, with a with a broad with from a, a broad point of view, and also trying to see how Colombia fit in 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 the context of Latin America, which was uh, something that um, that that was uh, uh, briefly mentioned before, right? When we um, at the Eurasia Group uh, looked at the outlook for the region, and and we are trying we were trying to reassess the outlook for the region after the pandemic first hit, we mentioned at the time that this is a region, Latin America, that is in general poorly positioned to manage a pandemic, right? To manage the coronavirus crisis, which is sort of like <laughs> evident now, uh, uh, six months into the pandemic or, or a bit more. Um, this is a region with uh, uh, high levels of, of informality, weak health systems, uh, unlimited fiscal capacity, all of which is constraining the capacity of the different governments to mitigate uh, the health and the and the economic challenges. And, um, and Latin America was already in quite a difficult political and economic situation before the pandemic erupted. So we are seeing how across the region, um, capacity of, of the different governments, for instance, to enforce the lockdowns, to, to provide economic relief is, uh, is uh, going down quite quickly, which points to a crisis that it's going to be extended. Um, the response has been very different, uh, uh, but I'll guess that now it's, it's pretty evident that even those countries that were seen as doing worse or, or doing better at the beginning of the pandemic, Regardless, most of the countries of the region are struggling in terms of, of the number of cases per capita, the number of deaths per capita, the, the huge slump in economic activity, the spike in unemployment, and also very extended lockdowns that have created fatigue in, 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 in among the citizens. So it is a, a, a quite um, difficult to, to see how the post-pandemic outlook is going to look like. And, um, and a lot is going to depend on, on how the different countries, the different governments manage the, the health and the economic crisis. But I'll say that some trends are emerging and some of them clearly apply to, to Colombia, right? One is higher taxes. So at some point, the governments will need some extra resources in order to pay for, for the bill. Um, two is elections in a context of, of very deep discontent. Uh, discontent that was evident in, in, in protests in some countries in the region 
uh, driven by a broad uh, range of demands and that have probably accentuated because of the healthcare and the economic emergency. And then how difficult it is going to be for countries across the region, for, for governments, for incumbents, to enact very difficult adjustments. Um, so, so now, right, like how, how Colombia fits into this story? Well, uh, the pandemic really hit Colombia at a time in which uh, the president was facing low levels of, of support, um, lack of a, a, a strong majorities in country, in, in Congress. So he, he has had a sort of like, a, 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 he has never really had a very strong support from the ruling coalition or, or even from, 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 from his own party, and, uh, and also rising pressure from the streets. So Colombia did experience mass uh, demonstrations uh, 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 at to that began towards the end of last year. They were not as big and as frequent as, as Chile, for instance, but they were quite significant for a country like Colombia. Um, the pandemic erupted, prices of oil went down, and this obviously put significant stress on the economy, on fiscal accounts, and, and these challenges were probably exacerbated by, by the lack of, of structural reforms. Recall that um, when President Duque first uh, uh, took office, uh, when was this, in August uh, 2018, he presented a tax reform initiative that was a, a quite an ambitious bill it included, for instance, extensions to, to, of the VAT to basic food stuff. And, 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 as, and, and at the end, the reform was, was diluted. Um, uh, the most controversial aspect of that reform was precisely the extension of the VAT that was removed. Um, well, the, the following year, the court struck down and another reform was passed. But the point is that it has proven a, a difficult to enact unpopular changes in taxation and, and, and other reforms. Um, I would say that similar to other countries in the region and in the world, the actions that President Duque took at the beginning of, of the pandemic to mitigate the spread of the virus helped his, his levels of support. So we saw how his approval ratings went up in, in, you know, after he enacted uh, mobility restrictions. Even if the economic response of the pandemic has been limited by fiscal constraints, um, you have now the, 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 the decision of, of the fiscal rule committee to suspend the fiscal rule during, during 2020, during 2021, so until 2022, and that gives more space uh, uh, to the administration. So uh, measures to mitigate the impact of, of coronavirus and to help economic recovery, so measures for, for households, for companies. Uh, will expand, but but again, these are somewhat constrained in comparison with other countries in the region, uh, Chile, for instance, because of 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 the fiscal position of Colombia, the position where it was at the beginning of of the pandemic. Um, and I would say that that in general, what we see is that uh, uh, President Duque's popularity probably going to decline, uh, uh, given the extent of the crisis, given the, the fact that the economy has collapsed, unemployment has grown, there is this fatigue with, with uh, uh, after a, a, an extended uh, a lockdown. Um, so his approval ratings will, will probably continue going down. Um, a risk of protest is also going to be significant. Uh, so we recently saw this, this um, renewed demonstrations that, that uh, were triggered by the death of this man in, in police custody and, and, and probably, uh, you know, this anger aggravated by the fact that there was this uh, horrible video circulating in, in social media. But I would say that, that in that respect, uh, 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 there was this trigger and there was clearly anger over police actions, but the... Um, but the demonstration showed more, more, more deep factors, right? It showed discontent that is quite significant, that was evident in the demonstrations that erupted last year, and that has not really disappeared, right? It has just been on hold because of the pandemic, because people do not take to, to the streets as much, particularly at the beginning of, 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 this, uh, of this pandemic, because of fear of, of infection, because of mobility restrictions. But we can expect that the risk of uh, 
um, a protest is, is going to, to be significant. Um, and, and then uh, I would say, well, you know, like what does this really mean for, 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 for policy and, and for any, any type of, of reform going forward? Um, and uh, and I, I would say that the fact that it is likely for the government to keep a, a low political capital and, and for social dynamics to, to remain fragile, this is going to, to constrain the willingness and the capacity of the, of the president and the political class as a whole to pass some popular measures that, uh, that are needed or that are seen to be needed um, after the pandemic, right? So, so, for instance, a tax reform that contains a, a unpopular elements to boost revenue and, and therefore to, um, to, for the fiscal deficit to fall within the parameters of the fiscal rule from, from 2022 onwards, or a, or a structural a, a pension reform that, that is something that has been under discussion in Colombia for, 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 for a while. So these reforms were already looking difficult. Uh, well, they, they probably look even more difficult now, given the pandemic, given the, the, the limited political capital of, of, of the administration, uh, the, the fragile social dynamics, and also that the political class that will be in charge of passing these measures uh, is, um, is likely going to be discussing these measures in, in, well, that will be next year, so very close to the next election cycle, right? Colombia is going to have congressional elections in, in March 2022, a presidential elections in May. So it's a, it's a challenging political, social, and, and policy outlook. Uh, but I would say that, that that has a lot in common with the challenges that we are seeing in other countries in the region, right? So when I was talking about Latin America and the trends that, that were emerging, I mentioned the, risk, the need for, for higher taxes or for measures to boost revenue, which indeed ap applies to this case, the elections that are going to take place in a context of, of deep discontent uh, because of, of demands uh, that were evident in, in last year's demonstrations, but also uh, because of discontent that is tied to, to, to the fallout from, from the pandemic. And then finally, how this is going to make it very difficult for Colombia and for other countries in the region um, to enact difficult, difficult adjustments. So not, um, not, a, not a, a very uh, um, nice uh, uh, outlook uh, we're in the middle of, of the pandemic but but again I think that many of the social political and policy challenges that Colombia is facing at the moment have a lot in common with what we are seeing in other countries in Latin America and and more broadly all right thank you Marilyn. Uh, ambassador please come back to um, in which you uh, mentioned how, for example, uh, Colombia has had a huge contraction of its GDP. It's pretty much the worst that we have seen throughout the world. So looking forward uh, to the future and how uh, you can create a strategy to help Colombia rebuild and rebuild for the better, uh, how do you see, for example, the role of the private sector into contributing to rebuilding an economy and generating uh, uh, employment in, in the nation, basically, now also that there's possibilities of having additional uh, investments in the nation. And could you, for example, give us one idea into the role of uh, private sector in uh, rebuilding the economy and overall how to deal with this uh, deep crisis in terms of the economy that Colombia is facing right now due to the pandemic? Well, the first thing that we need to uh, understand is that uh, this is a world crisis. This is not a Colombian crisis. This is happening everywhere. And there are countries that are more affected, not only in terms of uh, COVID uh, consequences, but also in terms of economics. There are countries that are expected even to uh, contract more than, than Colombia and actually is happening. Second, I will never underestimate the resilience of Colombia as has been proven in the past two decades. While many, uh, in many countries that face even crises less deep 
than the one we face by the end of the 20th century and beginning of this century. Uh, in many cases, private leaders left the country. In many cases, uh, somehow, uh, you know, the situation broke apart and the consequences were dramatic for countries. In Colombia, when we had those very terrible circumstances, we were able to found consensus. Uh, first of all, the consensus of security that somehow, you know, create a different reality for Colombia, you know, decreasing violence and all types of crime, you know, to the lowest levels in four decades as we speak now. And I think that was important and that is something substantial. But to connect with your view, I think that private sector has been very much uh, very relevant on all this. First, because they didn't leave the country when things were difficult. They continue to invest and they continue to develop their businesses in spite of these terrible uh, scenarios. So now when I put myself in today's world, in this 2020, uh, in a world pandemic, well, I think that this conversation that among private sectors uh, leaders is happening to promote and to propose to government ideas for reforms and at the same time ideas for specific investment projects that can allow the creation of jobs and the creation of opportunities and the recovery of the economy, you know, prove somehow how we can try to work, uh, you know, public-private coordination in order to regain momentum. I'm not saying this is going to be easy, and I'm not saying this is going to just happen out of the blue, but I'm saying here, this discussion is happening as we speak, and I think we will find some, some space, of course, the obsession in these years to come in a country like Colombia, I guess worldwide, but definitely in a country like Colombia, considering what uh, Maria Luisa and I described on social unrest and what I explained very well about an uh, unemployment uh, number for uh, the youngsters, implies a very strong commitment for creation of jobs, opportunities specifically for that uh, targeting the population, and at the same time, you know, strengthening the education for jobs. There's a, a big discussion all around the world about education. A lot of people said, uh, what do you need for a solution in society? Education. Well, it's true, but education for what? And what matters very much is connecting this education with sources of income. It implies jobs and entrepreneurial opportunities. Final comment on something that I heard from Maria Luisa. Uh, about uh, uh, the, the current political environment. Not to forget that in the past month, uh, you know, uh, Congress elected the uh, national prosecutor or the national inspector. Uh, the, the, the Congress elected also uh, a new member for the constitutional court, our highest court. And the Congress also elected uh, you know, uh, someone that we call, we will describe as the ombudsman of the nation. These three are very senior positions and the majorities were gained by the government majority. So being fair with President Duque, which of course is not as strong of as, as other presidents in the past, as has been described in terms of his potential of putting reforms ahead, we have to see the facts. And the recent facts show that he was able to put a majority and on these three occasions, his majority was able to elect the person that you know, he would prefer, proving that there's a possibility still of creating majorities in Colombia for future reforms, pension reform, and definitely a tax reform by the second half of 2021. Now, Marilisa, I would really like to follow up precisely on this last element that uh, Ambassador uh, Pinzon was mentioning, and it is the capacity of creating consensus in Colombia, which was precisely something that you mentioned as an element that uh, created added uncertainty in terms of the political outlook in Colombia. So uh, I wonder whether or not would you agree with this position by Ambassador Pinzon and uh, this thing of creating consensus in Colombia to be able to move forward, is this one of the major leading roles that the Colombian government should take on moving forward to try to uh, in, uh, improve it, its political outlook for the future. How do you see that? 
Yes, thank you. Um, what I would say is that basically the, the capacity of the government and the willingness of the government and the political class to reach consensus over topics that could be unpopular in nature is going to be more difficult or more constrained as a result of the pandemic, as a result of the potential decline in levels of popularity, how um, fragile are dynamics in the streets, and that is going to become even more complicated as the congressional and presidential elections approach. So does that mean that there are not going to be any reforms approved next year? No, I don't think so, right? Like, so for instance, at some point, they, they will probably need to pass a tax reform by the end of 2021 in order for it to, to, to take effect from, from 2022. The contents of that reform and how much it can boost revenue then that's a, a, a matter for discussion. And that, I think that it's part precisely of that discussion where these difficulties in reaching agreement will be accentuated by upcoming elections, by, by well, by the huge economic contraction that we are going to see this year and the fact that people are angry or are angry with the economic situation that it's not happening in Colombia, but in the whole world, but less willing to endure this, this same um, a, a, a sort of like a, a more painful adjustment, right? It is, it is more about the contents or what is under discussion. Now, uh, the economic situation, I would like to uh, other of the elements that work, and it is uh, part of the plans or strategy that uh, could may come into fruition in Colombia uh, moving forward. In particular, you mentioned uh, how, for example, we need uh, there in Colombia to create a fund uh, to be able to advance in the post-pandemic uh, recovery. Uh, do you see uh, any other idea or example that uh, we could bring into fruition in Colombia? Because after all, part of the uncertainty that we have, not only in Colombia, but also being part of the international community is what's the plan? What do we do now that we're navigating this so unexpected territory? So what do we do? Any ideas on how this fund can actually become a reality and what are the ideas do you believe that we could implement in Colombia moving forward? There's the need of a national recovery plan. And that's the way this has been framed as we discuss. And the National Recovery Plan, as I said, requires national government funds that still come from the emergency fund, especially for the social uh, activities, those families that are in need. Second, investment funds coming out of the, you know, fiscal funds that, of course, are affected, but still, you know, uh, debt continues to be a source of funding. From local governments, there are a lot of uh, uh, investments still in the local uh, plans from a city like Bogotá, Medellín, Barranquilla, that will be relevant for this. And definitely, we're trying to focus on institutional investors, local institutional investors, um, by establishing certain kinds of projects in, the, in which they can uh, invest. I don't have any doubt that uh, international funds that are seeking for where to put their liquidity uh, that is abundant right now worldwide, and that is seeking for you know, better rates will come to countries like Colombia. Colombia historically has been attractive to many of these uh, investors, uh, especially in the United States and Europe, mainly because the tradition of never defaulted, the tradition of macro prudence uh, fiscal policies, and somehow that has created some uh, credibility vis-a-vis -vis history for Colombia. Now, what matters is what projects, where do we put these uh, ideas out of this plan. And the ideas are mainly focusing on uh, infrastructure for competitiveness, which matter very much. Colombia, even before the pandemics and even after the pandemics, will continue to have a challenge to enhance its productivity, especially the logistics of our infrastructure. That implies uh, ports, some airports, and definitely enhancing the quality of roads uh, to, to, to lower cost. Second, housing. Not to forget, Colombia has three million families without a house or living in a very low 
conditions. And that is a huge opportunity because of course, government has been providing certain kind of subsidies for housing. But if you match funds and establish financial closures between government subsidies and financial uh, uh, sources, definitely you can create a social impact, but at the same time, you know, move forward the whole economic value chain uh, that is related to, 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 to housing. Thirdly, agribusiness. Colombia has a huge potential on uh, agribusiness, but the fact is that we have a very low industrialized uh, agriculture uh, system. The big opportunity right now is first to provide what we call tertiary roads. The government has put even in the budget for 2021, something like, uh, I would say $500 million or 1.5 billion pesos, which is a relevant money for tertiary roads, especially in isolated areas of the country, even that can contribute to confront illegal crops. That's even a positive because if you allow the uh, local farmers to move out their projects, their, their products, uh, that's very, very important. But second, we will have to find out out of the pandemic, how to strengthen certain industries that can create value added into some of our agricultural pro products. I think that's an important discussion also uh, ongoing. Fourthly, I would say connectivity and digital economy. Pandemic all around the world, but definitely in middle income countries like Colombia, has proven somehow part of the social divide, the inequality between those who have access like people that is connected right now, like us on these kind of systems that can do some kind of teleworking that can even uh, be creative and, and, and make use of technology to provide income and even to spend time at home for education. That is not the truth for a very uh, important number of people in a country like Colombia. So we will have to discuss if we make connectivity a, a public, a, a basically a, 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 a public a, a right, if you put it in perspective. And that is something that has been under discussion and needs to be seen. How do you do they, this with uh, the providers, the technology providers, and of course, uh, the government? Then you have to make an effort, as I described before, on education. Mm -hmm. Education for having income. Education for the next economy, for the digital economy. And this is a very relevant reform and challenge that uh, we have in the year to come. So I think this is all being discussed. And the new thing is this idea of trying to create a, a joint fund between public funds and private funds that can do some venture activity in this new kind of economy. That will be a very strong statement. Of course, this is a vision. This is a plan. We need to figure out how to create a consensus around this. But I think that discussion is going on, on different levels. Of course, I, I would be in agreement with Maria Luisa with the idea of elections in the year 2022. And I said during my first uh, comments, my initial remarks that unfortunately elections this time started not one year before, but two years ahead. Yeah. And of course that's challenging and it makes agreement and consensus more difficult. But I think majorities in Congress can be created. A consensus between you know, private sector and government can be uh, at least uh, created. And I think more important than all, this is not in the interest of one sector, of one party. We're in the middle of the worst ever crisis that is known in history of economics of Colombia, but I would say everywhere. Yeah. And this is an opportunity to really lead, to really have this kind of conversation and to find ways to move forward. And I'm hopeful, although I'm realistic too. I know that the threats coming out of the uh, crime in Colombia, of the frustration that is there, of very responsible populist politicians that are out there too, is very risky. Some misconsequences coming out of the Havana Agreement also are there, but we can overcome this. We have overcome even worse uh, situations in terms of existential reality for Colombia. I remember by the year uh, 
2000, 1999, 2001, Colombia was, a, a, you know, a, a fractured country. A country was expected not to be even a single nation. It was a failed state, according to many. And we were able to overcome that. And in a period of 15, 20 years, we reach a point of progress. Pandemia comes, of course, it brings poverty, it brings unemployment, but now we have an opportunity to, you know, touch down and, you know, pick up again. All right, thank you, Ambassador. And finally, before moving to the open Q&A question, Maria Luisa, I would just like very quickly to follow up on you on the role of social unrest uh, for the current political uh, climate in Colombia. Uh, is there any element in particular that you would like to highlight into how social unrest uh, could either still be creating problems in Colombia and how do you see the role of this latest wave of uh, social unrest in the nation as having a major role in the definition of the future political climate? climate in the nation. Yeah, sorry, I was in mute. Um, I think that it's a, it's a, not only in the case of Colombia, right, that it's a good reminder of what will probably be among the main challenges for this administration and for other administrations across the region, which is to uh, make sure to make sure that they are tackling social discontent, which is driven by a broad range of, of issues specific to, to, to each country, but, but probably that includes, but is not limited to more and better public spending among many other issues, while at the same time, making sure that uh, they push for favorable investment conditions, that they help economic activity, right? Economic recovery, and that they eventually pass reforms that are needed or that are necessary for adjustment in a much more difficult environment because precisely of precisely because of the social dynamics and the electoral calendar. So it's at the end to balance all of this, right? To tackle this content, one, to ensure economic growth, two, uh, to pass a reforms that ensure adjustment in this very complicated environment. All right, thank you. Uh, now we're going to move on to open our uh, session. Uh, we will begin with uh, Nicolás Garcia. Uh, and then just a quick reminder that as soon as both uh, Mario Lisa or uh, Ambassador Pinzon, uh, anytime you want to weigh in, you're free to do so. Uh, we're having first a question on something that definitely has to do with uh, all of the reality that we're living in Colombia. And it's got to do with the influence of the crisis of migrants and refugees uh, from Venezuela. So uh, overall, uh, Nicolás, wants uh, to ask your insight on uh, what should be Colombia's policy towards this wave of migration and how much of a role do you see this crisis having a role in internal politics and economy and the overall outlook for the country? Maria Luisa, maybe you want to begin? Yes, I, I mean, we, we don't, don't give a, a, a policy recommendations. What I would say is that this is clearly, this has clearly been a, a great issue for, for Colombia for, for a long time now, uh, which, um, which apart from, you know, like from the social specific perspective, it created significant pressure on the fiscal as well because of, of uh, 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 because of spending, and that was actually one of the reasons why, why the Fiscal Rule Committee uh, relaxed deficit targets some years ago, but it's also an opportunity for, for growth, right? It's an opportunity for greater consumption, for greater economic growth in, in the future. Um, I mean, with respect to, to, to the specific stance, I think that Colombia has been probably that country or one of the countries uh, with the most... Uh, outspoken position of trying to seek regime change in Venezuela, but at the same time, it is a, a, a clear that the sort of the, the capacity of the government to, 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 for this to result is, yeah. is quite limited, right? It's quite constrained and, and it has also been a, a, a very evident from the beginning that there were a, a, 
limits or that Colombia wouldn't be in a position, for instance, to support a, a, some sort of like military intervention. I don't think that this is going to, to, to change. So it's, it's basically how to, how to, how to, to weather this very challenging uh, migration situation now in a, in a new and di more difficult position, which is the, the, the coronavirus crisis. Now, Ambassador, you believe that uh, policy in any way should be adjusted in Colombia to uh, think of a possibility of uh, including Venezuelan migrants and refugees as part of this uh, strategy. Do you believe that there is uh, any idea or role that uh, this should be taken into account? Alejandro, eh, Venezuela's Maduro's regime eh, is a real nightmare for Colombia is very problematic for us. On one hand, they support and promote terrorist organizations that have, have acted against Colombian people and Colombian uh, national interests. Second, they allow in their territory uh, criminal businesses like drug trafficking and uh, illegal mining. But not only that, before they did it for, uh, I would say, purposes of ideological identity. Now they do it for the purpose of business to sustain the regime with drugs and with uh, illegal gold and illegal cult and extracted even in Colombian territory. Then the permanent violation of human rights, the destruction of democracy and institutions in Venezuela have implied that millions of Venezuelans have flee. And almost half of those Venezuelans that have flee, the 4 million Venezuelans that have left the country, are inside Colombian territory. <clears throat> Colombian democracy have shown, I would say, the level of values that we are supposed to have. Being open for taking care of those Venezuelans brothers and sisters in need. And it has implied policies that uh, many countries have supported in order to take care of these immigrants. But let's face it, even before the pandemic, that was a challenge in fiscal terms, in social terms, in security terms. Now, the pandemic, of course, irritates this and make this situation very dramatic. We always have seen the positive side, which is, okay, a lot of Venezuelans came, that has implied uh, labor force, young labor force, sometimes even qualified labor force that has somehow contributed to Colombian economy and to uh, productivity. And that's the positive of all this. Uh, the hard side is that when you have 20% of unemployment, and in addition to that, you have still uh, people coming from abroad, it is quite uh, challenging. And, on this, I believe Colombia will need to continue to request uh, international support. I think UN needs to continue to support, and I uh, expect other nations to continue to support, because this is about a humanitarian aid and crisis, people in need, people that is not here because they like it, people <clears throat> that is here because they don't have any other chance, and maybe if they stay in their own country, they might get killed by their own regime. So this is very important to, to see it as a, as, a, as a concept that is not a Colombian problem. Yes. This is a Latin American problem, an international problem that requires an international response. Pastor Robinson, I want to stay with you. Uh, we have a question coming from Juan uh, Castellanos, and it's got to do with, uh, uh, we quote unquote, very strict business regulations in Colombia. And he wants to know whether or not you have any ideas on how you could work with the government uh, to be able to bring more investment into dealing better negotiations, into having better regulations that are not so strict in a country. Any ideas on how would you work in this matter to incentivize investment in Colombia? And we're just like super close to the end. So uh, if you could give us a broad uh, idea on this. Well, there has been a recent conversation that has renewed again considering the unemployment rate and especially the youngsters unemployment about a labor reform. How do we make them, the, the, the labor market more flexible and less complicated? 
that is not an easy uh, solution. And I will put myself on this on Maria Luisa's thoughts, trying to flexibilize the, the labor market in the middle of unemployment should be the right thing to do, but it's the most difficult time to try, <laughs> you know, because of course there's frustration and, and it's not easy to, to move forward. But that conversation is going on. And I think there are some signals on that. The other two things that have become very difficult in Colombia, being very transparent, is uh, environmental safeguards. This is happening everywhere, but definitely Colombia are becoming very difficult for extracting businesses, even those that are doing these kind of businesses with very high standards. And what some people describe as social safeguards, the consultations to populations in certain areas. Because, of course, those communities deserve to get benefits out of investment, but sometimes are manipulated by uh, political interests and even criminal interests that makes these communities uh, get into a very difficult position, being pressured. We need to work on to that. There is a law that is being discussed also and is part of this set of uh, uh, private sector uh, ideas uh, that contains a package that includes a review on the social safeguards policies in order to make this a little more streamlined and more effective. Finally, uh, as part of what has been recommended to the government, we have tell, told them that uh, on those almost 300 projects, uh, investment projects that I described from public infrastructure to uh, urban renovation uh, all around the country, we are telling them that they need to create inside the presidential palace, uh, among the presidential advisors, the clear responsibility to make a streamlined process for all these projects. So investment can flow faster and the projects can really create its purpose in terms of jobs and progress. All right, thank you so much, Ambassador. And with that, we end our section of Q&A. And now, Lina, uh, the floor is yours. Lina's with the mic off. You're in mute. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, Maria Luisa, and thank you, Ambassador uh, Juan Carlos Pinzon, for this great discussion and for giving us the new insights into the outlook of, for Colombia. Uh, I also want to thank uh, our team for making this event possible, and thank you for all participants. Uh, we will look forward to meeting with you again soon. Thank you so much, and thank you, and have a nice day. Bye. Thank, thank you, Lina, and thank you, thank you very much. Lisa, thank you, Alejandro, and thank you Gracias. all that were connected here. Appreciate your, your presence. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye.